We'll see if I remember everything. So, hi, I'm Lauren Voswinkel, and I wanted to talk about pay. So, we live in a capitalistic society, and in capitalism, corporations have this goal, and C Corps specifically have a legal obligation to make as much money as possible. And yet, for people, we're often told that working hard is our main goal. We need to be good workers and contribute to society and whatnot. But see, there was uh, a politician uh, now close to six, seven years ago who, uh, or no, not, not, not that long ago, for like four years ago, uh, who, who said something, and that uh, corporations are people. Well, in my, in my mind, if corporations are people, that means people are corporations, and thus really making money should be our main goal too if we're in a capitalistic society. <laughs> So I wanted to talk about um, this question here. It's a question that often gets asked when you're interviewing for a job, and it is, what is or was your previous salary? And my advice to you on this is avoid answering this question at all possible turn. And if someone says, we require this information, well, then I'm requiring you to do something else. Why? It is illegal for, for uh, a employer to ask the previous employers uh, for salary information, and they're really only kind of allowed to verify employment dates. So they can't really get verification on what, you're, on what you, you said. Um, and then I want to talk about uh, a company policy that's in a lot of handbooks, and that is don't talk about salary. That's illegal within the US. According to the National Labor Relations Act of 1935, there sh is explicit language that says that conversations about pay are something that is 100% encouraged and cannot be prohibited by a company. So with that in mind, I wanted to say that I now have nine plus years, I haven't updated these slides, in the industry. I've spoken at numerous conferences. I'm well read on various industry topics and actively practice programming as well as going to numerous code retreats. Um, I teach through Girl Develop It and I am a senior web developer at a DC based company and I make $122,000 a year. That's a really scary thing to put up on a screen. The first time I did, I was terrified and I asked the rest of the room, uh, this was at Cascadia Ruby last year um, down in Portland, and I asked the rest of the room to, to also like, shout out their, their title, their location, and their salaries, and got a really good response from it. But I wanted to talk a little bit about why it was so hard for me to do that. The, the, the fear of retribution is one huge thing that like, made me really anxious about talking, uh, talking about this topic in general and was something that needed to be overcome in my opinion. I had been working for five years or more uh, making a constant salary uh, and then when I finally took my own like, advice and not, didn't say anything about my previous salary and started lying to people when they were like, we need that information. I saw my pay increase over 200% um, in two years. So that's, um, that's a little bit of a, of a tell to me how important it is to have active conversations about this because we need to be able to have realistic understandings of what we should be making for our skills. So with that said, when I gave this talk, I found myself in San Francisco uh, a couple of months after uh, this past November, uh, talking with a couple of my friends, uh, and one of the people included was uh, Shanley Kane, and I was saying how like I needed to, uh, to turn this into a full-length talk so I could have like this conversation with a, a room full of people, and she jokingly leaned over and was like, I know this woman who has this company or this publication that would really like to, to maybe publish this type of a thing. And so if you ever felt like making an article, maybe I could get you in touch with her. And I was like, fine, okay, I will write this article. 
Um, so I found, I, I wrote the article, um, and in the article, um, I made a call to action. That call to action was on May 1st, I encouraged people on Twitter to share their salary information publicly and with their face attached to it um, in order to break down this taboo of not talking about pay, whether it was due to, to politeness, fear of retribution, or what have you, the law basically protects us talking about openly about our pay. So after that went down, there was um, a lovely woman, maybe you've heard of her, um, Stephanie Murillo, who stepped in and at, like said that she would be willing to anonymously uh, tweet salaries from people of color and other other underrepresented people so that um, their voices could be heard without fear of like uh, retribution um, that tends to target underrepresented people significantly more. Um, and so uh, because of that, I, I felt a I, I honestly, Stephanie, I felt a little like conflicted about it because I wanted people to have names attached to it because there's already services like Glassdoor that, um, that allow people to uh, share their salary information and whatnot, but there's no names attached to it and there's no, there's no people attached to it. And so when you're looking at a, at a company and you see, oh, there's, like, there's a salary range of 80,000 to 250,000, somebody who's unsure of themselves, who's suffering from imposter syndrome, who uh, is part of an underrepresented group or something, they will make excuses for why they don't deserve that much. So like, what I wanted to do with, with Talk Pay was really put these faces to things so that you could look at somebody and be like, wait a second, I've worked with you, I know what your skill set is, I know the things that you're capable of, and I'm just as, as capable, and you make twice as much as me? That doesn't seem right. And so attaching these names was, was kind of critical to me. And so, but Stephanie brought up some really great points. And I thought, thought to myself, okay, why does this taboo exist? And why, why are people hesitant to talk about it? And again, retribution is the, one of the main concerns. But there was a lot of people on Talk Pay that talked about how they, they felt like it was uncouth, that they shouldn't share this information because of some moral uh, moral reasoning that like it felt like they were either rubbing it in people's faces or they were ashamed of it. Um, and so I started doing a little bit of digging as I uh, remembered some of my sociology classes in college. Uh, Max Weber uh, did a long in-depth study uh, towards the, the beginning of the 20th century about um, Protestantism and the and capitalism and the Protestant work ethic and the this concept of the Protestant work ethic basically um, substantiated this idea that we work because work should be its own reward. It is a it is something that when you do hard work, you get enjoyment from that. And so it started occurring to me that potentially the um, one of the, the reasons why people felt anxious about sharing it for, for social reasons was because of that, that attachment that people should be happy about the work that they're doing and that the pay that they're getting is just a nice side benefit, which is complete and utter crap. <laughs> um, what, what this type of like social conditioning and um, projection ends up doing is it causes people to, uh, people who need to talk about these things because they're being treated unfairly by, by society at large, they're getting paid less, whether that be women or people of color or uh, different religions. These people need to be able to talk about this information because they're not being fairly compensated. And having this in place basically allows people to say, well, obviously you're not a hard worker because you don't enjoy the work that you're doing. You feel like you deserve more. You feel like you're better than the work that you're doing. And so this ends up kind of reinforcing these 
terrible beliefs about, uh, about minority groups or underrepresented people saying, oh, well, they're lazy, or oh, they're, if they're working for less, they must be undocumented, or oh, they, they don't have the same scruples as we do. Like, we can rationalize away why we shouldn't give these people a, a fair shake, basically. Um, another thing that, uh, that I wanted to talk about here because this is open source and feelings, I figured I'd start bringing in some, some discussions about how uh, free work, in particular, ends up harming uh, underrepresented groups. Uh, in particular, a lot of companies now, because of how many people are starting to, to go into the tech sector, are now almost requiring open source contributions and requiring or encouraging open source contributions or discouraging people that don't have open source contributions is a really, pardon the language, but it's a damning concept because the people that tend to be able to contribute to open source communities are those that have the resources in order to afford their own computer, afford their own internet access, afford, um, people that are able to help with childcare or cleaning services, people that just have someone else helping around, helping out like a, a spouse or whatnot, they're not like an only, the, an only parent. All of these things affect whether or not we can contribute to, to open source and for, some, for a company to say you can't work here because you don't have enough open source contributions is another way we end up keeping people out that want to get in. Um, another, thing that uh, particularly bothers me about the, the open source community, and it's not really the community so much as uh, what happens afterwards, is people pour in all of this effort and uh, trained skill to produce software that can be used by anyone, and what ends up happening is companies then use that to make substantial amounts of money but there's no compensation that flows back to the open source community for devoting that time to developing these software strategy solutions and strategies that companies are then profiting off of. And so that further excludes people because of the fact that there's, if you are already struggling to make ends meet and you are uh, encouraged to do free work, that's a devaluing of, of your abil ability to make ends meet because you're spending time doing this instead of uh, helping with childcare or doing your normal hourly job or what have you. So having these companies basically take open source contributions and make money off of it but not giving back to the community in any tangible way is problematic in my opinion. One kind of stunning example in my opinion uh, is Randy Harper's work on the Twitter block bot. Uh, she developed this, uh, this strategy that allowed groups of people to uh, cultivate lists that would block people on that list. And Twitter had been bothered uh, it seems like they were bothered, but they could have been taking it seriously, but I doubt it. Um, but like it's, Twitter has been, um, sorry, uh, Twitter has been like pushed by a lot of people in the community to develop strategies to prevent abuse on their platform. And so after years of not responding to that, Randy went ahead and developed this, this with other people and Twitter ended up basically just kind of taking the entire idea and implementation and saying, here, we did this thing, and then didn't pay her for anything. It's like, this was developed for your platform to meet a particular use like and uh, user base, but you didn't compensate somebody for the work that they did. That, to me, seems terrible in, in the case of a, of a company that's making a substantial profit. Like, that person helped to improve the quality of your platform and you didn't pay back anything. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to talk about is something that I've seen quite a bit in tech in general. Um, how many people here uh, have worked at a company or currently work at a company that 
pushes them to contribute more hours per week, say 45 hours per week. Raise hands. Uh, how about 50 hours per week? 60? Anyone? No? Oh, there we go. 60 hours uh, a week regularly. You're being paid 50% less than what you should be. For those who work 50 hours a week, you're being paid 25% less than you should be. 45, 12.5%. You're based, you are working at this company on a contract that says that you'll work 40 hours a week, except in, cer in certain special circumstances. But when that becomes regular, they're basically committing wage theft of a sort. They've broken their end of the contract and they are taking money from you. They're taking time from you and not compensating you in, in recompense. Maybe they'll pay for pizza every once in a blue moon and make you feel a little special that you got a free meal from them. Or maybe they have beer at their, at their office. That's great and all, but beer is not a 12.5% increase in my salary. <laughs> These, th like, this also ends up contributing to a phenomenon that I've seen, and I have previously been guilty of it. I have a story that I, at my first job, was working on a project, and I wanted to take off, the, off that Friday, and was told that the project that I was working on needed to be completed um, before I took off. I ended up working 37 and a half hours over a 48 hour period. And I thought that made me like a superhero for a while. Like I thought that this was great. And I often hear people com like comparing these war stories as though they're like a badge of honor. When in actuality, this is 100% like horrible abuse and wage theft. Like I worked 37.5 hours in a 48 hour period when I was being paid on the basis of, of working 37.5 hours over an entire week. They got like 30 hours extra out of me that week, just in that, those two days. And that needs to stop. We can't put up with this. Deadlines and these, these arbitrary constraints that are placed on us are just that. They are completely arbitrary. Most deadlines can shift. If you're being told, oh, this needs to get done because we're having a meeting with the founders, but the founders have a regular meeting set up, it's okay if it slips. It's not the end of the world. We cannot, like, the problem with this, this push to rush us to, to, to work hard and cause these burnouts and not compensate people adequately will never end because the deadlines will continue to not shift and people will continue to feel like they need to put in those hours and then continue to not be compensated for that time properly. And we need to be able to talk about these things. We need to be able to have these conversations on a wide scale and we don't need to feel shame about it. We are like legally protected about talking about this type of thing. Yes, there are implications where people will make, a, will make up an excuse about why they're letting you go that aren't related to, to pay uh, or to discussing salary or discussing work conditions. But the more that we do it, the more that that will be seen as, some, like, as a behavior that isn't punishable. And that's why we really need to continue to talk pay.